All right, so let's begin. Um, we have an exciting um, event this evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us today at Bank Street virtually to hear from our new chancellor, David Banks. My name is Shale Palako Saransky. I am president of Bank Street College of Education. And as of this moment, we have over 200 folks um, from across the city tuning in. Um, and the number keeps growing on the bottom of my screen. Um, after we do introductions, Chancellor Banks will share his vision for our schools. And when he's finished, he'll be joined um, by several members of his leadership team and together they'll answer your questions. So before I'd introduce David, let me just say a few words about Bank Street for those of you who don't know us. Bank Street trains about 650 teachers and aspiring school leaders each year. We also work with hundreds of schools and childcare centers across the city to provide professional development supports. Unlike most teacher training programs, almost all of our faculty are former teachers or school leaders, which means that what we teach is really practical, grounded, and useful for educators. And one of our mottos is learning with greater depth, teaching with greater impact. And what we mean by that is we always start from the belief that you need to understand and build from the strengths of the child, the educator, and the school. This means knowing students well and recognizing that relationships matter and in fact drive all learning. If schools are not set up to nurture relationships, learning grinds to a halt. Connected to this is an understanding that social, emotional, and the cognitive parts of our brains are deeply intertwined. You have to teach the whole child valuing who they are and who they want to become. When learning comes to life, when it's hands-on and for young children involves play, when it feels important, students engage and learn deeply. Too often though, the opportunities for high quality deeper learning in our schools are not available to everyone. At the heart of our mission here at Bank Street is understanding what drives inequities in schools and then working to make changes so every child has access to a great education. When I first heard that David Banks would be our next chancellor, I was both excited and hopeful. He has been working his whole career to build a more equitable school system in New York City. Chancellor Banks was born in Brooklyn and is a proud graduate of New York City Public Schools. After a year working as a school safety officer, he began his first teaching job at PS 167. From there, he went on to become a founding principal at the Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice. This is where I first met David while I was a first year principal nearby at Bronx International High School. I visited David's school and was struck by how different it felt to most other high schools in the Bronx. You could tell from the moment you walked through the door that students in this school were valued, respected, and challenged to excel. Chancellor Banks later went on to found the Eagle Academy for Young Men in 2004, and under David's leadership in his prior role as president and CEO of the Eagle Academy Foundation, the Eagle model was adopted in schools in all five New York City boroughs and Newark, New Jersey. Chancellor Banks', Chancellor Banks work at every level of our school system and his deep ties to communities across our city are powerful assets as he leads the effort to rebuild from the devastating impacts of the pandemic. Welcome, David. We're so proud and pleased to have you here this evening. Shale, thank you so much. And just thank you for your, for your leadership and your friendship. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, this evening to share with uh, all of your Bank Street uh, family, if you will. So uh, for I think many of the folks who on may not have met me, uh, I do want to say I'm also being joined uh, this evening by a couple of people from our team as well. Um, uh, Carolyn Quintana, who is our Deputy Chancellor of Teaching and Learning. Uh, we also have Christina 
Fodi, who is the Deputy Chief Academic Officer in charge of special education. Uh, Dr. Joanna Johnson, who's our Chief of School Culture, Climate and Wellbeing. And Jay Grieve, who's the Chief of Student Pathways. Um, each one of them is playing a very important role in the work that we're trying to do here uh, in, in this administration. So uh, just a word about me, um, <clears throat> just so everyone is, is clear, I'm, I am a product of the New York City public school system. Um, I had a great school experience from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Uh, the New York City public schools worked for me uh, and my family. I uh, grew up in Brooklyn, lived there until I was about 12 years old. My mom and dad uh, raised three boys. I'm the oldest of three. And uh, my father was a New York City police officer. My mother was an executive assistant working for the city and for the state. And I was very blessed, very fortunate. I had wonderful parents, loving parents who gave um, you know, the three boys everything that they needed. Uh, we were loved, we were nurtured, we were supported, and we were disciplined. <laughs> and so we, um, we, got, we got everything that we needed. We, we were engaged in activities in the community and just had a lot of fun growing up in Brooklyn before moving to uh, Southeast Queens, which was simply a, an adventure for me. I lived on a phenomenal block growing up and it was just wonderful. And part of the reason I'm sharing with that, with these things with you is that you understand that I come from a place where community has been extremely important, um, not only the love and support of wonderful parents, but of a community which also embraced me and my friends and, uh, and helped to put us on a path to success. I graduated from Hillcrest High School in, in Queens. Um, I was the vice president of the senior class, excuse the noise, vice president of the senior class at Hillcrest, which was to this day remains one of the uh, achievements in my life that I'm most proud of, um, and I'm friends with so many of the students who I graduated from Hillcrest uh, as well. I had not been in that school since 1980 until becoming the chancellor uh, just a, maybe a month or so ago I went to visit and it was just a wonderful um, experience to go back there and to be a part. Uh, and the place looked almost exactly the way it looked <laughs> when I left, uh, so just great. Um, so, <clears throat> I have no idea how I wound up in teaching and education. <laughs> it was not my goal. Uh, I, I went to college initially to be an engineer and then uh, and but ultimately decided to go to law school and went to St. John's Law School in the evenings. Um, but, but while I was going to law school at night, I decided to teach. And I taught in Brooklyn in District 17. And it was a great experience for me, uh, working with a group of elementary school students for uh, for about uh, six uh, six years, and uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you just how much my teaching experience impacted um, not only my career as an educational leader, but just my life in general. Um, working with the kids that I worked with for all those years in the neighborhood that I grew up in in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, uh, it was simply wonderful. And so, um, but I left there, and I left education altogether for a couple of years, worked for the city, worked for the state, attorney general's office, never thinking that I was coming back in education, but as fate would have it, I came back. I went back to school to get uh, even more credentials to become a, uh, a school administrator. And, and I served as a assistant principal for two years. And then I was a principal for 11 years. I was the founding principal of the Bronx School for Law, Government and Justice. Uh, where I served for seven years and loved my time there. And by the way, uh, while I was there, uh, there was a young lady uh, who worked for me. She was about 21 years old. And uh, eventually she became a teacher and she became my assistant principal. And then when I left to take on my second uh, principal's position at the Eagle Academy, uh, this young lady became the principal of the school. And then she continued to move on and became a superintendent executive superintendent, and ultimately she be preceded me as chancellor. And that is uh, Misha uh, Porter, uh, who uh, uh, the two of us have been very close friends for many years, and we helped to build a great school uh, in the Bronx, the Bronx School for Law, Government and Justice. And the only reason that I left that position was because I was responding to the need 
uh, around black and uh, Latino uh, boys and the issues and the challenges that they were facing. And when you looked at all the indicators of success across our system, it was those boys who were at the bottom of all the indicators of success. And, and I didn't wanna just complain about it, I wanted to do something about it. And that's the reason why uh, together with our organization, 100 Black Men, we created the Eagle Academy for, for Young Men. It was the first all boys public high school in New York City in 30 years when we opened our doors in 2004. And I graduated the first class of those young men and then moved over to head up the Eagle Academy Foundation, which had as its charge to replicate our model and to try to bring as much hope as we possibly could for, uh, for more boys across the city. And so we opened an Eagle Academy in every borough in the city. Uh, when Cory Booker was the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, he asked us if we would bring one to Newark and we did. And so today we have six schools, 3,000 young men. We've graduated over 2,000 young men and sent them to colleges and universities all across the country. It's a body of work that I'm very proud of. Um, and in many ways, taking the lessons that I've learned from their good and bad uh, here to this position. I was asked to be chancellor by Mayor Eric Adams, who I've known for over 30 years, have had a great relationship uh, with him. And uh, from the very beginning, he wanted me to serve as chancellor. I was reluctant. I, didn't, I wasn't looking to be the chancellor. Um, but after a period of time, I realized that perhaps this was the position that I should be in to try to have as much impact on the lives of as many kids as we possibly could. And I'm thrilled to be here. It has, as we've started our fourth month, um, it has been a wonderful uh, experience, but it's an experience that has allowed me to enact a vision and a set of beliefs that I have around what, this, what the New York City public schools should really be and how we need to show up on behalf of all of our children and their families. And so <clears throat> I've had hundreds of conversations with students, principals, parents, community leaders, elected officials. Um, and I think it has been that body of work and those conversations which have helped to shape the vision that I have for moving the school system uh, forward. And, uh, and, it, and it's, it's been framed in what I call the four pillars. Uh, and the four pillars which essentially stand up kind of my core values and strategies that uh, I think it will take for us to move forward. So they're in no particular order, but one of them is really about engaging families as real partners. And I will tell you, as I've been in this position now as chancellor, it is the one thing that has stood out among everything else which is the sense from parents and families that they have not been authentically engaged um, in our schools and in decisions that are made on, be, you know, on behalf of their children, that they have not been co-partners in the process and they are very upset about it. Um, and so that is part of my DNA. It's part of every body of work that I have ever engaged in as a school leader um, was about engaging parents and families and community. And that for me starts from a place where I truly and deeply and authentically believe in community. And I believe that schools are part of communities. And the notion that we should just have our kids and the only thing that matters are what goes on in the four walls of the schools as though it's somehow separate and disconnected from community is a notion that I fully reject. I'm a person of the community and I see schools and I see school leaders as representative of the community. If you, there are so many institutions in our communities that impact the lives of our kids, that if you divorce yourselves from that and from those influences, you cannot maximize imp impact for young people. So you have to have a respect for the community which I do, which allows you to then engage the uh, community in authentic and purposeful ways. And that is a message that I have brought to these community uh, leaders and parent leaders and families across the city, 
wherever I've gone, wherever I've been asked to speak um, so that they understand that that is a core value for me. And we're gonna to continue to build on that. And, and I think it's critically important that we do that. I, I didn't come here as an ideologue with my own set of uh, values and beliefs. I, I came here to be responsive to the families of our city. And there is no one voice across the parents. This is a very diverse city, very complex city. And from one neighborhood to another, our parents have different opinions uh, and, and perspectives on what they think this educational system should be in fact providing. And I'm trying to hear it all. I'm trying to be responsive to it as much as I possibly can. And I think you will see that in the work that I do, um, that is critically important. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to even raise it first because it's often not a uh, perspective that is lifted up, um, but is one that is important to me. So that is one, that's one of the first pillars. Another pillar is around prioritizing wellness and its, and its impact on student success. And no more important time than right now to prioritize wellness. The mayor uh, has talked repeatedly about his own personal experience and his own diet and how it's connected to his health. And he was in a position where he might have lost his life at one point. And so there was a fierce sense of urgency around changing his, uh, his diet. And he did, and it saved his life. And, and yet in our schools, um, that's a body of work that I wanna lean into, which is around helping our kids understand about eating healthy and taking care of their bodies, being physically fit, being attentive to your body as, uh, and, and your own physical health is critically important. And just as important is your own social emotional health, your own mental wellness. And, and that has been lifted up during this pandemic where so many of our children are suffering from a level of stress, depression, and so many other ailments um, which have affected them. And the schools are now called upon, and the school system at large is now called upon to be responsive to, to, to all of those kids and to our teachers who have also suffered greatly um, throughout this pandemic. And very often have been, we've skipped by the teachers to just deal directly with our kids. But all of our adults who work in our schools were negatively affected. And, have, and many have continued to be negatively affected by this pandemic. And so we, we have to be responsive to everyone. I've visited over 25 schools since I've been chancellor. And one of the things that's been really exciting to see is how many schools actually engage their students in mindfulness practices. And, it, and the, the adults in the school who have been trained in mindfulness. Um, and I find that just really uh, inspiring to see it to teach the students the practice of how to center themselves in the face of trauma. Because we have to remember that the pandemic was not the first time that many of our students have faced trauma, nor will it be the last. And so to teach kids a lifelong skill, to know how to deal with trauma and stress without lashing out violently and without doing harm to yourself, is in fact a skill that I support and we will encourage and we will invest in across all of our schools uh, across the city. And so I'm just very happy to see that. It's, we've, we've given each school across the city funding to be able to hire at least one social worker in their schools. For the first time in history, we've, we've seen that. And so that's a wonderful um, added kind of resource to have, but it is not the end of all of the issues that we have to deal with as it relates to mental health. And so there are other programs that we're also looking at and ways in which we have to support our kids. At the end of the day, the culture of a school will be the biggest thing that impacts our kids. When you have a culture that is strong and is loving and is nurturing, our kids are gonna be okay. When the students who attend our schools know that there's at least one adult in the building who knows them well and deeply cares about them, um, it makes all the difference in the world. And so being, being able to 
set a level of architecture within our schools that will allow for that nurturance to happen where students don't feel like they're just a number, but they are somebody um, and they are cared for. That is ultimately how you get to the process, to get to the place of, of, of dealing with mental challenges and, and awareness. We've, we've got to connect with you know, lo local healthcare providers and real experts that can provide levels of support. But, but kids have got to know that when they go to school every day, that that's a place that welcomes them and affirms them in their own identities. Um, and that's a body of work that we're going to continue to lean in on as one of our pillars. A third pillar is about what I call scale, sustain, and restore what works. So you st I start from a place where, you know, anytime you get a new mayor and you get a new chancellor, there's a new administration, very often they throw out the baby with the bathwater. Programs that worked um, get dismissed in order for the new administration to be able to put its stamp on, on its own new shiny toy. And it was very important for us in this administration to demonstrate that we want to lift up those practices that we know that work. There's amazing work that is happening in our schools. And the general public needs to know that. And the DOE has not done a good enough job in telling the stories about the great things that are happening in our schools. I'm going to change that and I'm going to change that not only personally to be a champion for New York City Public Schools, but I'm gonna be a champion that lifts up students and teachers and principals and administrators and school safety officers and food workers that you will hear from us on a regular basis about things that are working, programs that are working, college access programs that are working, literacy programs that are working, science programs that are working, Across the city, some of the best and brightest educators from across this nation exist in our public schools. But we don't talk about it. We don't lift them up nearly enough. And we need to do that for two reasons. One, we have to create a greater level of trust from our families. And if they don't know about the wonderful things that are happening, in their minds, they don't exist. And I need to make sure that we are ensuring our parents that there are just wonderful things and we're trying to build the capacity of other schools to do that work as well. Over the last five years, we've lost 120,000 families have left our schools. If you wrap your mind around that. 120,000 families for a host of reasons voted with their feet and decided that New York City Public Schools that they, they wanted a better option than that. And I have met many of those parents and I've met many parents who are also on the cusp of leaving, but it said, I don't want to leave, but you've got to give us a better reason to be a part of New York City Public Schools. And that's, a, that's going to be my job. That is my job is to give those parents a reason to continue to be a part. And for those who have left to give them a reason to come back and those are the things that we're doing. Those are the things we're gonna be working on. That's one of the major pillars. And the other part of that pillar is to build the capacity of other schools to get better. This school system has for far too long created winners and losers. Some schools do really well. We write great articles about them in the paper. They get all of the spotlight. And then we lament the fact that we've got these other schools who struggle. Um, but, but, but who, who is in those other schools? They're, they're the same kids from our neighborhoods. And it is my job to ensure that everybody succeeds. And I don't believe that we can do that unless all the schools are sharing across the city their own best and most promising practices. It's not enough for me to tell a school that's struggling to get better. You can say that all day long. You can say it as loud as you want. Unless you teach people how to get better, it won't happen. And the best teachers to ensure that it will get better are their own colleagues, many of whom have, may have had their own uh, set of struggles and they overcame it. Well, those lessons in overcoming it and getting better and improving your school, 
Everybody needs to hear that. And I want to ensure that we're doing that. And that's what I refer to as scale, sustain, and restore what works. Amazing practices across the city. We're going to build out a level of technology where just when I click on your own phone, you'll be able to log in and you'll be able to see the great work that's happening in schools all across New York. Um, and so that's a body of work that we're leaning in on. And that's, uh, that's the third pillar. And the fourth and final pillar is a pillar that talks about reimagining the school experience. The fact that we're coming off of this pandemic and our kids have returned to school, um, it's been said over and over, we, we can't do school the way that we were doing it before. For far too many of our kids, they weren't doing well before the pandemic. When you look at 65% of black and brown children when never achieved proficiency in the school, in our public schools. That's, that's completely unacceptable in a, in a system that has a 38 annual billion dollar budget, $38 billion annually. It should be unfathomable that anybody, any child doesn't learn how to read by the third grade. And so in that reimagined experience, one of the things we're doing is we're taking a very close look and trying to re-engineer how we even teach reading and the science of reading to our kids. And so there are lots of approaches. There are lots of things that we're looking at right now. Uh, I have said very broadly that I think we should be returning to a more phonetic approach to the teaching of reading um, because the results are in on our current approach and they have not worked for far too many of our kids. In fact, when I became chancellor, I met a man named Bill who stands out in front of Tweed every day. He's been standing out there for over 10 years and he holds a sign. And he's a guy who used to be an educator for over 20 years in Ohio. But he spends his time every day in front of Tweed where he spends a few hours just engaging people walking up and down the street. And the sign that he holds up simply says, if, if we would just teach the kids to read. And I met him and we had a great conversation. I told him I, I agreed with him. He said it would solve all your problems. All of the issues you have, so many issues we, we have, it's, it's kind of what Mayor Eric Adams talks about, this upstream downstream analogy. Um, we spend so much time, effort and, and resources trying to fix a problem uh, that we would spend a lot less money if we got the problem fixed right at the very beginning so that there never was a problem. Every child in our school system needs to know how to read by the end of by, by third grade. And if we ensure that, the ceiling is so much higher for the things that we can do for our kids because part of that reimagined experience is something that uh, I talk about as the North Star, which is kind of creating bold futures how to ensure that all of our young people are gonna have opportunities in the 21st century workforce. Far too many of our kids are going to school day in and day out through what I call a schooling experience, but not necessarily being truly educated. And being truly educated means also understanding what the light at the end of the tunnel looks like. You know, what does the 21st century economy represent? It's a fast changing global economy. And our kids need to know that. And they need to know what are the skills that should be developed so that they can take their rightful place, whether they go to college when they graduate or not. They ought to be able to have skills, certifications, industry credentials, and a clear post-secondary path for themselves. And again, we, don't, we do that pretty well in some places, but not across the vast majority of the school system. And I wanna change that and we're going to change that. We're gonna present the power of possibility for our kids. It's hard to dream of becoming an investment banker if you've never met one. It's hard to know what the life, you know, what that job is like in the, in the biotech industry if you've never had any exposure to it. How do, you, how do you know how to prepare yourself to work at a place like Google or Microsoft, if that's your choice? If you decide you wanna be a graphic artist, a designer, a dancer, whatever it is that you seek in your life, our school system ought to be putting you in a place where you get a level of exposure to those kinds of careers. That's one of the reasons why we're big supporters of even career technical education. 
This is not, this is not, you know, my grandfather's uh, shop class. <laughs> you know, career technical education today, when done right, can really put kids on the path to the middle class and beyond if they are fully prepared. And we've met with corporate CEOs all across the city who have said to us over and over again, we need you to graduate students from the New York City public schools who can do some stuff. We've got a set of skills and knowledge uh, where they can take their place in some of these jobs, which are, which are here and which if we prepared our kids for, they would be able to step into great careers for themselves. And I intend to do that. Uh, and so those, those are some of our, our, our those are the four pillars, uh, making sure that our kids are civically uh, engaged. Is that another big thing for me, making sure we've got student government and kids are debating the issues of the day so that they understand this world that they live in. For, it, it's, 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 it's again, it's, it's unacceptable to me that we graduate students and we give them a high school diploma and we send them on their way and they have no idea how democracy works. They don't know how local uh, democracy works and local government works, city, state, federal. They couldn't tell you the difference between a state assembly person and a local city council person. They don't know what the attorney general does. They have no idea what the local community planning board does. Shame on us. Shame on us. We've had these children from kindergarten and, and for many of them even before then. And we take them all the way through the end of 12th grade. But for many of our kids that we've had them 14 and 15 years. And we ought to ensure that there's some real things that they know how to do so that they can ensure a successful life for themselves and put them on the path to, to, the, to economic prosperity. That's what this administration is going to be about. That's what our focus is gonna be. That's what our energy is gonna be on. Um, those are our four pillars. That's, a, that's our vision of where we're trying to go. Um, and so at this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to, uh, to any questions that you might have at this time for me or anybody on my team. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Banks. That was a really powerful description of the vision and really grateful for laying it out so clearly. We did gather well over a hundred questions before wow. that and several more coming in as we go. So we're not gonna to get to everyone's questions, but we have about 20 minutes. So um, let's get going on some of them. Um, one person asked, you know, how your experience as the founder of Eagle has shaped your vision as chancellor today. Um, what were the things you learned there that are sort of touchstones for you as you think about the work ahead? That's a great question. I thank you. And, and I would say to you, probably in a word, uh, culture. Culture. That, that was the biggest part about e Eagle. Um, I remember we were visited once at Eagle when I was the principal and it was a superintendent from Kansas City. And he came to meet me in the summertime. And we had had a, a summer bridge program that was happening. And he was asking me all these questions about our strategies. How do you, you know, kids who are behind, how do you catch them up? How do you get kids to believe in themselves? What are your strategies for math and science and that kind of a thing? And then he came out with me to our step up ceremony where at the end of the summer program, the students had written compositions and essays to their own parents about their dreams and their goals for themselves. And one student after another pouring out their heart it was incredible. And this super, and it was almost not a dry eye in the house. And these students were sharing this with, alongside their peers who they had only met three weeks before. <laughs> and he looked over, he leaned over to me and he said, now I get it. It's not even about the specific interventions. What you've done is you've created a culture here that allows the kids to take off that armor and to lean in, in their just authentic humanity. And you get to see, in, in the case of Eagle, like little boys, who very often the narrative that plays out about them is that they're tough guys. But in a place like Eagle, you see them for who they really are. These wonderful, brilliant, loving little boys. I don't care how tall or how big they are, 
They're little boys, just like everybody else. But Eagle was a place where they take off their, their armor. And that's what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to, we want to be able to help more schools across the city understand how to create a level of culture in your school that allows for students to show up in very authentic ways um, and not have to wear armor. Whether it's an armor you're protecting yourself as a boy of color who's afraid about how the press plays or talk, talks about you or being afraid of the police in the streets or whether you are a young person who's an LGBTQ student who's afraid of being bullied and hassled and, and not being able to show up in authentic ways. Um, whoever you are and all of your true self-identity that you can bring that to a place. Students want to do that, but they have to be given permission to do that. That's what school culture is all about. And that, that requires a level of training and support for schools as well. And that's, that's probably the biggest thing that I learned from Eagle. I could tell you a hundred other things around mentoring and engaging parents and all that, but it's about culture that lifts up high expectations and says to students, we're gonna give, every, give you everything you need to be a success. And uh, I'm gonna help you to make sure that you believe in yourself, that you can in fact achieve those things. And so that's just a, a general framework uh, that I take with me from Eagle to the larger system now. Thank you, that was great. Connected to that, there's a question on, it's, so many young people have had traumatic experiences over the past two years, and you did mention some of the work you're already doing around adding social workers to schools, but can you talk in a little more detail about how you're thinking about addressing the social and emotional needs of scholars, faculty, and staff um, as we recover from the pandemic? Well, one of the people who came with me from Eagle, who is now here with me as our chief of school culture, climate, and well being, and is really leaning in in a big way in this space, is Dr. Joanna Johnson. And at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Johnson to, to respond to that question. Good evening. We recognize that uh, social emotional supports are critically important, particularly coming on the heels of the last 25 months. Um, our families have been challenged, our students have been challenged, the disconnection, the isolation that we experienced as part of the pandemic has been critical um, and young people have showed up differently. We also realize that there are societal issues and challenges that existed way before the pandemic that the pandemic just illuminated further. When we talk about social emotional supports, we do so at several different levels. Um, Late in the fall, we introduced the DESA screeners. And so we have these social emotional screeners that really allowed schools to start to pinpoint and gather the data to have better understandings of who are the young people who were sitting in their spaces? What were some of the experiences that they were having? What were some of the challenges that they were having? But specifically, what were some of the strengths that these young people demonstrated that we could then cultivate, support, and align? And we did so in a unique way. In many instances, social emotional work happens in a separate class, in the morning, outside. We're working with teachers to integrate the social emotional supports into the academics. When we think about the six hours and 20 minutes or so that young people spend in a school day, the bulk of it is spent in the classroom engaging directly with teachers. And so how teachers lift up these social emotional practices, those soft skills that you need to take into your professional lives and how we drive them and we use them. How do we think about self-awareness, self-regulation and management? How do I get in tune with my emotions to be clear around when I'm having a good day, when I'm having a challenging day and when I need new opportunities to think about things differently? And so we, we've, we've used the screener to kind of give us a baseline around where we think students are. We rely heavily on relationships because we know relationships sit at the core of the work. And then we put explicit strategies in place. In our elementary schools, we have the Harmony program, which really uses tools and techniques to teach our younger children how to understand what they're feeling through stories, um, through character development, um, and through teaming and buddy work. We also recognize that if the adults aren't well, then the young people aren't well. And so we've built in, we've trained a core of yoga and mindfulness teachers to really think about how do we pause for a moment to get ourselves together? How do we pause to put our own masks on first so that we can support and we can ensure that our young people, um, our young people show up in their best, best and authentic selves. 
those are just a few of the ways that we, we started to think about social emotional supports for our young people. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is one that's close to my heart. As you know, I founded a school for recent immigrants, Bronx International, and one person here is asking, how are you going to provide additional support for our English language learners to feel successful and to build a sense of belonging in our system? Very important issue uh, for us. We've been spending a lot of time uh, there. It's been a wonderful experience for me being engaged in that space as well. And uh, uh, one of the people that's really driving that and, and a lot of our um, literacy initiatives here really is, is, is our deputy chance. So I want to ask her to lean in a little bit at this point and respond. Uh, Carolyn Quintana. Q. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for that question, Jill. Um, and as a former Bank Street uh, student myself, um, really excited to, to be part of this um, group tonight. Um, so we have a, a lot actually in the works, and I really wish that um, the head of our uh, Division of Multilingual Learners was here, um, but she is supporting one of our um, folks as they become a doctor this evening. So really exciting. Um, but we are actually looking to expand the uh, bilingual programs that we have right now, um, really focusing on helping schools to better design their programs, working alongside our school design, uh, Office of School Design, um, so that we can help them rethink the structures they have in place at the same time that we actually provide the teachers with training um, and we bring in uh, better and uh, new heritage language curricula as well. Um, we're also looking for some of our older students who may be newcomers uh, to the country um, to think about uh, expanding opportunities for them to have spaces that are um, transfer schools. And so looking at transfer schools that would house L's in more boroughs, we currently have them in very limited places. And so we wanna create more opportunities for students um, who are older to be in spaces where they can catch up uh, at the same time that they're learning um, the new language. Um, and then the other piece that we're working on is just helping schools to improve their current um, approaches to teaching L's, uh, focusing greatly, and not as much on the L teachers as um, the other content teachers so that they know how to work collaboratively. They know the strategies that are gonna help support the students. And as the chancellor mentioned, our big focus on explicitly teaching reading in order for students to be able to engage in the speaking and the listening um, in, in really just being part of the class as a whole, I think is also going to have a great impact. And we've seen some fantastic um, uh, examples of these practices across schools already. I was in a school just last week where um, kids were having a heated debate. Uh, they'd done the research, they were looking through articles, they had roles, and the students who needed to participate in their own native language did so. Um, with kids who spoke their language also flipping through the pages um, and then were able to give some really sophisticated responses that an interpreter helped um, to interpret. And so they were able to participate in the whole group because the, the school had established these practices in the school. And so we wanna be able to, as the chancellor said, one of his pillars is to scale and sustain what works. Um, we wanna be able to find those practices, lift them up, um, and then work with schools to talk about the process to get those practices in place in the first place so that we can really support teachers. And that's the big piece, right? Um, you heard Joanna, Dr. Johnson talk about uh, the, you know, the adults being well. We wanna also make sure that the adults um, are well prepared. And, and when they are, then we know that we'll be able to, to access, um, to, to have a greater impact on students. And so, um, thank you. Thank you. And we're also very proud, Caroline, to have a Bank Street alum as Deputy Chancellor. Um, <laughs> so I got a bunch of questions on special ed. I'm gonna give you two of them together and you can um, see where you go with it. Um, first one is, what are your plans for addressing the shortage of special education teachers, um, particularly in neighborhoods um, that are high need communities? And then second, um, how will you help students with disabilities and diagnoses who have been disproportionately affected by the remote learning experience? You know, um... The, the notion of uh, recruitment of more teachers for special education is something 
that we're going to have to be engaged with uh, our university partners uh, in terms of helping to produce uh, more uh, teachers for us and to prepare more students rather uh, for us in our schools. But a big part of that is also about how the, the narrative that we are able to project around our schools. And, and, and in fact, you know, we want to make this a place where teachers really want to be and create a level of excitement. Uh, I truly believe that um, we're going to help to restore the New York City public school system um, to being the best uh, school system uh, anywhere in the country. And that's a body of work that we're leaning into. We've got a great team to help us to do that. Uh, be some very specific recruitment strategies of teachers all across the nation, in fact, um, who, would, who would seek to come here. Um, but it is one, also one of the areas that I've heard so much about even before I became chancellor was just so many of the issues and the challenges um, in special education. And, and since I've gotten here, I realized that um, there's, just, there's a level of support that is needed um, in order for us to, to achieve the goals that we're trying to do. Christina Foti is here with me this evening as well. And Christina, why don't you just talk a little bit about you know, some of our plans and things that we're looking at um, in, in, in for, for our special needs uh, learners. Absolutely, thank you, Chancellor. Um, and good evening, everyone. Uh, President Saransky, it's not lost on us all that you've done to make sure that our special education students are integrated. Um, and as someone who spearheaded the special education reform, uh, we owe you uh, we are owe you a debt of gratitude for all that you did to carve spaces out for our students with IEPs. Um, I've been had the honor and pleasure of joining Chancellor Banks on many school visits, uh, and it is. Um, his love and passion and joy uh, that that emanates from him when he visits our schools, whether they're District 75 schools serving students with disabilities uh, or otherwise uh, is just palpable. And we're so grateful for that kind of leadership and passion um, because with that, we're gonna be able to make the shifts that we need to make in special education. So we're, we're utterly grateful to Chancellor Banks for that. Um, as Chancellor Biggs said, we're working on uh, many things around special education to improve the provision of services and the quality of instruction that our students with IEPs uh, receive. And, and critical and key to that, right, is our special, are our special educators. And so um, in addition to partnerships with our wonderful establishments such as Bank Street, um, we're working to make sure that uh, these partnerships are, are in place so that we can get the highest quality educators uh, that are out there. Um, and the only thing I would add uh, on this topic is really that we've come a long way in I, I being able to identify our gaps in service provision. And so really targeting those areas with the greatest need um, we're able to do that. Uh, and with the support that we're receiving from this current administration, we're so delighted uh, and optimistic about uh, the teachers that we're gonna have in place um, and continue to do, we'll do that in partnership with uh, folks such, such as the wonderful people at Bank Street. Thank you. So another sort of topic here that's come up in several comments is, what plans do you have? You mentioned in your in your fourth pillar, um, David, the work around career um, focused schools and um, career education. And how do you how do you envision a strategy to expand and improve the quality um, of that work, and particularly in our high schools? You know, um, uh, when I met with. Mayor Bloomberg, uh, he told me that if he were still the mayor today, this would be the North Star. Career pathways, creating opportunities for young people to, um, to really be able to lean in um, to the possibilities for themselves and their careers. So at the, at the end of the day, you know, why are we taking all of these kids through a school experience in the first place, <laughs> right? We're not doing it just to do it, we're doing it because we need them to be um, part, active participants in this democracy, but we need them to also um, be on a clear path to economic prosperity. I mean, we, we, we're not doing all this and making this kind of investment just for, just for kids to just kind of come out and do whatever. We want them to be able to achieve their real 
dreams for their own lives. And that's what our job is here, is to, is to help to, to ensure that we are providing a level of support for them to manifest their own potential um, and to be all that they want to be. But in, in, in order for us to do that, one of the things we think we have to do is to create real opportunities for kids to understand what the 21st century economy looks like. What are the, what are the jobs of the future? They're changing seemingly almost every year. There's just new things that are coming. It's moving at a very fast pace. And we've got to prepare our teachers for that space. Um, and it's not simply about providing internships for kids, but it's about a whole new way of doing school that will really prepare our kids for these opportunities and helping to raise the, the consciousness of our teachers, our teachers around what this new world economy actually looks like and how can they best prepare students as well. So it's a, it's a merger of the kind of corporate community, our educational community, our not-for-profit community and our students and families bringing it all together in a way that I don't think we've ever done in our schools uh, before. Uh, one of the leaders that we brought on to, to, to lead this work really is Jay, Jay Grieve. And Jade, uh, thank you for being here. I know we, we've all been moving around quite a bit, but I thank you for taking a few minutes and as well as everybody on our team who's been able to be here. Because I think it's also important, Shell, that um, people recognize that this is not the David Banks show as chancellor, right? That we have a very solid team of some really brilliant people uh, who are deeply committed to, to, to transformational change uh, for this system. And, uh, and Jade is one of those people as well. So Jade, if you just talk a little bit more uh, just about our vision uh, for the Career Pathways work. Thank you, Chancellor. And thank you, Shay. It's great to be here um, this evening. Thanks for the opportunity. <clears throat> just to build on a little bit what the Chancellor shared, because um, there's so much there, but just to unpack a couple of things. Um, I think a really important piece of what the Chancellor is saying is, is yes about kind of ensuring that young people are on the pathway to long term economic security and a rewarding career, but that we really see career connected learning as a way to engage and excite young people in their learning today and their possible futures. And I think a big part of this is helping to expand uh, the opportunities that young people see. Uh, I think the Chancellor's used the phrase before, like you can't see, you can't be what you can't see. And so, so um, Shao, you referenced high schools uh, and there, there's obviously, that's a big place for us to be focused and to support educators um, right across the city. Um, but in addition, I think there's big opportunities for us, us to start much earlier and really be focused on middle school as a place for really deep exploration and awareness at the time when young people are forming their identities and occupational identities are around this work. So I think starting earlier is a big part of it. But to unpack a bit of what the Chancellor is saying, so, um, we, we really want to see all young people with the opportunity through our public schools to, um, yes, get access to a, a rigorous academic foundation, but in addition to that, to ensure that we're giving them the opportunities to build real skills that we know are necessary for success in the 21st century economy, financial literacy, digital literacy and fluency, uh, and, and certainly career readiness. Um, making sure that all young people have the chance to build um, a, a strong dynamic plan for what they want to do uh, once they leave us. And also that young people are getting the chance to get a head start. On, uh, and, and so that, that can be things like early college credit, which we have some good examples of that happening in many places across the city, but chances to do much more of that. Uh, and and um, industry credentialing, uh, where, where that leads to, um, to, to strong um, economic opportunities and a chance to get real world experience. Uh, and so we see a big opportunity for us to play a role in that and to bring business and higher education partners along with us to, to create more of those expanded opportunities too. Thank you. That's exciting. So I have to tell you that there are so many more questions that we're not going to get to this evening. We're at the end of our time. Um, and we may have to invite you all back for another session later. Um, <laughs> but I really appreciate um, it's been exciting to, to hear this vision, um, to get to meet so many of the leaders that you brought onto the team. And we're, we're looking forward to what you're gonna be able to do in the coming years as you build out this vision. Um, so if you wanna just say anything in closing, David, the floor is yeah. yours. Yeah, uh, just thank you very much, Yale. Thank you for the invitation to be here with you. I've known you for a long time. I appreciate you, I appreciate your leadership. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, in the 
uh, Bank Street um, uh, family uh, who, who, who turned out. You've got quite, a, quite an audience uh, here tonight. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more questions in the limited time that we, that we have, but uh, just trust that we are working very hard. It's tough to come in in schools in the middle of a school year, um, but we've been using this time to visit, to, to speak to uh, all of our constituencies and to do everything we can to ready ourselves for this summer. We, we are gonna have a very robust summer, 110,000 uh, seats uh, for our summer school students, the largest ever, 100,000 summer jobs for our high school age kids, the largest uh, ever, uh, and looking for it to be a really wonderful, meaningful, relevant uh, summer experience for kids that's really gonna be launched as we go into the next school year. We're really gonna put our, our stamp on our vision for going forward for the school system. So just ask you all to stay in touch with us in ways if there's anything you think we need to know, any studies, any research, um, and any of your thoughts and ideas, please feel free to share them with us. And uh, we look forward to continuing to partner with you, Cheryl. Thank you. And thanks everyone um, for turning out this evening. It was a great group. We had almost 300 people. Um, and I really appreciate your thoughtful questions and look forward to future conversations like this. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks for having us.